As forward-thinking designers, we understand that before you can think forward toward the future, you must think in reverse towards the past. Just three miles north of Philadelphia's commercial and civic district known locally as Center City, you will find something marvelous. As you pass Gerard College's infamous wall, you are overcome by a sensation. If you sit still, you will notice. Everything is going to a beat. It's the beat to keep. It's the beat of the heart. It's being beaten down the world. And like old time lowdown, like in ancient civilizations, the slave boatmen rowing galleys to a beat. For generations now, this neighborhood known as Sharswood has kept this beat roaring despite nearly a century of being beat on. Sharswood has historically been beat with a red lining, a process which marked off lower class, primarily African American neighborhoods from receiving reasonable if any mortgages and loans. Rather than letting this beating defeat them, the people of Sharswood have reframed this negative act of being beat into something very positive which is the very beat, or rather pulse, which inspired our design. We are the forward-thinking designers. My name is Ilana Honig Juarez. I'm a second year master's architecture student with a focus on sustainable design. I also have a master's of science in nonprofit management. My name is Jeb Burley. I'm a fifth year bachelor of architecture student with a minor in animation. Hey, Enrel. My name is Derek Sabinga. Uh, I'm a fifth year architecture student with a minor in energy systems. Hi, my name is Manoj Sundamurthy. I'm doing my master's in architecture second year. Hi, my name is Kyle Chang. I'm a fifth year architecture student and I'm um, doing a minor in sustainable design. Hi, my name is Teddy Pickering and I am a fourth year landscape architecture student. Across the team, we have vowed to work with whole systems. Thinking of long-term system change rooted in immediate action, design is meant to inspire, and we hope to catalyze that inspiration. By treating each existing constraint as a stakeholder or a potential asset, we can envision development that is inclusive, collective, and resilient for both new and existing residents. Before considering the design process, we created a web of key subsystems that represent Philadelphia as a whole. Through software, we are able to track impactful events on the environment of the city, including equity, infrastructure, and nutrient flow. Arrows represent relationships between nested systems, each of which embody reactions across both time and scale. The neighborhood we've selected is Sharswood in North Philadelphia, a region that is hidden from the rest of the city due to a lack of transportation and commercial resources. The area consists of large swaths of unoccupied land that is owned by the Public Housing Authority. The housing market currently exists in a state of flux between renters and multi-generational homeowners. A typical block is characterized by grassy meadows, abandoned properties, and historic 19th century brick row homes. A typical block contains a few key characteristics. The most common condition is the missing tooth, when a row home is demolished and the properties on either side become exposed to the elements. When enough row homes are missing, the result is a baby tooth. Row homes in this condition are almost always abandoned or soon to be demolished because they're thermally compromised on both sides, with little left to address water management. This translates to an increasing need for affordable housing. The historic building stock is too expensive for many residents to maintain. So these antiquated homes are acquired through eminent domain to enable a process of clear-cutting and new development. Here is an example of a new multifamily development built on one of those cleared blocks. These are rented units, transforming previous homeowners into tenants. Current development strategies are not objective in their master planning, and historical landmarks are routinely wasted in pursuit of quota-driven construction. We believe this is wasted potential, wasted energy, and have chosen to see existing structures as assets in a larger holistic design process. So we ask the question, what if energy is the missing link to making housing affordable? In denser, urban contexts, plots of land are rarely attuned to suit a passive form. By bridging multiple parcels of land already owned by the same local housing authority, cutting for Solar South becomes more than possible. Once the building is oriented in response to the sun, the massing can be stepped back to reduce shading from the existing homes. Staggering the building creates pockets of green, respecting open space and property lines, and ultimately allowing space for living systems to flourish along a new green corridor. Lastly, the mixed programmatic functions will create an inclusive community through the resources they provide, cultivating collective security through eyes on the street. A landscaped path wraps up to surround the building, offering second and third floor accessibility to new and existing residents within the block. Multifamily development is already particularly well suited for affordable housing. But net zero construction is the long needed lens towards creating lasting capital and affordable housing. Net zero projects can produce healthier environments, non-existent energy bills, and financial stability from season to season. Affordability is a direct result of the design and construction process, 
and a stricter bottom line can eliminate the majority of operating costs typically passed on to the tenant. Reducing energy consumption is important, but zero is an arbitrary place to stop. After all, the building is just a backdrop for the lives that will be lived here. Natural systems find a way to utilize every resource available while returning that energy in one form or another. Our approach addresses all forms of energy moving through the site and through the neighborhood, offering more impact than any one form of energy alone. The block we have chosen is in a unique stage of its life cycle, a nearly vacant patch of grass containing both existing homeowners and vacant structures. The redevelopment of Philadelphia is creeping in from the east, and soon these homeowners will be bought out or removed by the housing authority to create a blank slate for new affordable housing. This is a block scale development derived from a regenerative design process. The building incorporates existing homeowners and repurposes historic building stock for much needed public amenities. Standard development practices are constrained by a narrow definition of profit, limiting the potential for improving the system as a whole. Hilding explores the potential for development to serve as a connective tissue to the microcosm of an urban block and expands the concept of profit to encompass not just an investor's bottom line, but the creation of social infrastructure. How can building new affordable housing nourish, educate, and empower the communities they're built in? The biggest restraint for developers is neighborhoods that don't want them. What if low-income neighborhoods sought after development? The mixed-use component allows opportunities for impact through the varied program, and the symbiotic relationships create multifaceted support. This is not unlike the way ecosystems share resources. Opportunities to reflect nature's strategies include responding to water supply, using occupancy schedules to flatten peak use, climactic adaptation, even including redundancy. All strategies to minimize waste and conserve energy. Based on the 80-20 parameter, the program is divided to provide occupants with amenities that could otherwise be outside of their physical or economic proximity. There's a strong correlation between social connections, health, and longevity. These amenities connect new residents to each other and shared amenities connect them with the larger neighborhood, providing an opportunity to engage in sustained, reoccurring actions that encourage the development of community. Sharswood does not currently have access to fresh groceries, and many residents walk over a mile and a half to get fresh produce. With nourishment in mind, the keystone of the block is the grocery store co-op. Additionally, the new grocery store will act as a common bond between residents new and old, offering working member discounts and meal programs with the neighboring school. In addition to strengthening the economy of the entire community, the food co-op and cafe create five living wage jobs and supply 850 people in the neighborhood with a source of fresh produce and quality pre-made foods. The 1,700 square foot community room and commercial kitchen is a flexible space that increases social interaction. In hydroponic greenhouses and a community garden managed independently with their own irrigation, food may be grown either for consumption or for sale in the co-op. The greenhouses can produce either one-third of yearly food needs for 50 residents, grow 10,000 pounds of lettuce, or 30,000 pounds of tomatoes. Flowers grown on the roof can be sold below in the co-op. On the west side of the block, a 27,000 square foot childcare center is made available to tenants, staff, and the Sharswood community. After hours, new parent support classes are given. A place to form social bonds and achieve greater physical wellness, the 17,000 square foot fitness center makes it easy for residents to work out. It consists of a yoga studio with views of the landscape, an exercise floor, and two bathrooms. A rentable 3,000 square foot event space with 16 foot tall ceilings not only formalizes a meeting space for the community, but has a 75% profit margin that contributes to the operations of the entire complex. A 15,000 square foot vocational workshop is a training space with tools available for resident use. Mail and storage are adjacent to the garage. Residences sit atop a thermally broken concrete podium that elevates the entire block for views and sunlight, while below, commercial functions make use of the grade level real estate. Laundry facilities are on every floor and ample enough to encourage social interactions. Units are oriented to ensure every tenant receives access to views and solar heat gain, and layouts are designed to maximize interior space in relation to the sun. Affordable materials like laminated plywood and bamboo flooring are utilized. Windows are mounted higher to allow daylighting deeper into the dwelling. Built-ins with CNC cut custom plywood elements are a simple, cost-effective solution for storage in a tight plan. Part of what makes this neighborhood attractive is the character of the materials. Brickwork is more expensive today and these row homes are irreplaceable. At this site, 
we propose repurposing three of the existing and unoccupied row homes to become stair towers for residential units. In doing this, we can reclaim the character of the neighborhood while recovering the embodied energy that would be lost by demolishing them. These towers would be air sealed and unconditioned, insulated through a prefab blue lamb structure. Through design iteration and energy modeling, we explored which shape privileged the most daylight hours across a single facade. Another study concluded that by elevating residential units, we are able to maximize the amount of daylight the units are able to receive. Utilizing AI paired with the Ladybug Energy Modeling Program, we were able to maximize design iteration. The way this works is by inputting design parameters as well as desired outputs. The program then iterates through thousands of possibilities which no human could do in a reasonable amount of time. This allowed us to discover that for our site, orienting three masses angled 11 degrees off of solar south was the optimal orientation in order to maximize solar potential. After optimizing passive orientation, we looked at opportunities and vulnerabilities within the form. Because the form maximizes solar exposure, further optimization of the roof angle was an opportunity to yield higher solar production. We recognized that by elevating our residential units above daytime programmatic functions, we had the potential vulnerabilities in losing heat and cool. The next step was to consider how each of the facades should perform. The average window to wall ratio across the entire building is 30%, with approximately 10% more glazing on the south than the north. On the southern face, box shading geometry facilitates heat retention and heat rejection based upon seasonal angled sun. The northern face encompasses strategies to mitigate heat loss with CNC built-ins and entry vestibules as thermal buffers. Handrails for walkways are made with, from white planes that reflect ambient light to the bedrooms on the north. The east and west faces employ center swing shutters and shoulder undesirable glare and unwanted solar gain. To support our passive approach, we selected dense pack cellulose as our primary insulator for roof, wall, and floor assemblies. Triple pane glazing for windows, rigid stone wool insulation for concrete foundations, and insulated concrete units for earth burn retention walls. At vulnerable connection points, we implemented high strength thermoset polyurethane to thermally break unconditioned spatial adjacencies. These attributes were considered deeply in our energy modeling process. Although energy modeling better informs our design strategies, it will always be imperfect. So the best thing that we can do as designers is to understand and control the assumptions that energy models make. We have selected ASHRAE 189.1 as a more rigorous sustainable baseline for construction using Energy Plus as the data source. This allows our energy model to generate more detailed and accurate assumptions about how materials in the building will perform. The process of energy modeling through Honeybee offers the flexibility to fine-tune building attributes to identify when the returns of performance are no longer effective, as well as account for most vulnerable conditions in the thermal enclosure. The prefabricated holes arm system was selected for its smart carbon approach and vapor open assembly. Manufactured locally by Blueprint Robotics, this system offers passive house standards at an affordable rate. Since labor costs in large cities are quite high, a shorter construction schedule translates into significant savings. A standard construction schedule for a development at this scale lasts 17 months. By using the Holzram system, we are able to shorten our construction schedule by 5 months. These savings can be reinvested into water management systems that will yield higher resilience in development at a lower price point. The Holzram system thrives on its airtightness but its performance is only achievable by being a drained assembly that is also breathable. The moisture barrier sits behind the rain screen, protecting insulation from soaking. Flashing at transitions and subsill ensure the moisture does not penetrate at the most vulnerable conditions. In this climate, fluctuation in dew point creates condensation at different points throughout the assembly. By implementing a combined air vapor barrier to the interior sheathing, vapor is blocked from entering the interior while still being able to evaporate out of the exterior. Glazing on the southern face is the greatest opportunity for direct passive heat gain, but also a concern for heat loss. To address this, the Hilding implements a dynamic shading system that bounces indirect daylight through a fixed transom, while also blocking direct sun exposure. The east and west sides of the shading device act as insulative shutters to the largest openings of the southern facade. They are manually operable to retain heat and cool during the night with daylighting sensors that tell the panels when to open in the morning. Our most challenging connections occur where the podium meets the wood construction. Structural loads are distributed into point load pedestals that have a compressive capacity for up to 1000 PSI. 
while achieving an R value of nearly 3.8 per inch. These pedestals reduce hard costs per linear foot of high compressive strength foam, embodied carbon costs, and thermally break between the podium and the wood construction. Pedestals would be site installed on top of cured concrete podium. Foundations vary across the three buildings. Where concrete is sitting below condition zones, we have implemented R16 stone wool insulation and R38 insulated concrete units. Within the prefabricated assembly is built-in mechanical ducting. Primary air ducts are housed between the I-beam joists and factory sealed before installation. Openings are connected when interior finishes are applied. Insulating between floors and demising walls increases thermal zoning capacity as well as STC ratings. Demising walls consist of 2x4 cellulose with two half-inch layers of straw tech wallboard on each side. This reaches an STC rating of 66 compared to the standard of 50 and achieves two-hour fire rating. The next step towards energy efficiency is to design for highly intelligent and redundant mechanical systems. The primary importance of a mechanical system is to provide fresh air, evacuate pollutants, and manage humidity. This is to protect our health and then to provide us with comfort. We selected these systems by evaluating how they serve the use of the space. Understanding use from the perspective of energy comes down to understanding scheduled occupancy. Mechanical systems are fine-tuned to reflect occupancy, allowing us to account for fluctuation of internal loads and peak demands while making energy reductions through strategic distribution of energy. For commercial functions, a variable refrigerant flow system with Mitsubishi energy recovery ventilators were employed, selected for their pr low profile installation, energy recovery and conservation capacities. A standing column geothermal liquid to liquid heat exchange will precondition the VRF refrigerant lines even further by re to reduce their loads. When the daytime demands subside in the mixed use program, Leftover heat and cool will be redistributed to north-facing residential units via secondary fan ducts that run up through a vertical chase. This air which runs across a charcoal filter for purification reduces the amount of energy that the Minotaur is required to heat and cool the space. The efficiency multipliers of all these mechanical strategies combined resulted in an EUI reduction of 39. This doesn't include the energy savings that would have been gained via the commercial waste heat capture. The Minotaur system was selected for its unparalleled efficiency regarding dehumidification, temperature, and ventilation. Not only does this system recover heat, cool, and moisture from stale air, but it has more intelligent set points for when air should be exchanged, recirculated, or conditioned. Leveraging this hyper-efficient system is how we are able to use the commercial waste heat in residential units. Starting from the building performance database for multifamily buildings, the implementation of a passive building form cut our EUI in half. Next, our super insulated airtight envelope reduced the demands of an active system. Once energy loss through the envelope was minimized, optimizing the efficiency of mechanical systems brought the EUI even lower. The last step in reducing consumption was designing at a scale and through the lens of the occupant to provide maximum opportunities for energy savings. The extra cost of renewable energy today is the promise of low energy costs tomorrow, averting ecological damage. Photovoltaics represent an 